members in the audience and uh, the visitors. Today, the first uh, lecture on uh, cardiac care for senior citizens. So this is uh, handled by the subcommittee of elderly care in uh, College of General Practitioners of Sri Lanka. And I'm proud to present the first lecture today. And uh, we are going for one hour's uh, time. And I think the resource person will end uh, giving you some time to ask questions and uh, he will give you the answers. And this is going to be the historic change in the lecture series because uh, uh, we are going to give you most to the general practitioners. This is uh, this will not be mostly on theory, uh, and but it will be only practical and uh, the genuinely for the general practitioners' uh, perspectives. So uh, I'm going to introduce my resource person today. He is none other than Dr. Ajit Vanyarachi, my good friend and my batchmate. Uh, he graduated from University of Colombo. And uh, he served as registrar uh, in cardiology at, in uh, in hospital <laughs> in the, the unit of cardiology uh, in uh, Colombo. And uh, after his uh, registrar period, he went to overseas training to Australia, and it was Alfred Hospital in Melbourne. And afterwards, he got uh, fellowship in structural uh, heart disease and uh, peripheral vaccine disease at Severance Hospital in South Korea. And he has served in many hospitals, including Avisavela, Kegol, Disoisa Maritri Hospital, and Kalubovela. And now, currently, he's at Amradhapura as the interventional and clinical cardiologist. Uh, over to you, Dr. Ajit. We are ready to learn from all the perspectives. So, uh, at the outset, let me thank uh, uh, College of General Practitioner of, of Sri Lanka uh, and the Subcommittee on Elderly Care, including Dr. Situtani Puliyarachi, for giving this opportunity to uh, discuss about cardiac care uh, for seniors, a GP's perspective. Uh, so these are the list of topics that I would like to discuss today. Uh, what is the definition of old age? and what are the pathophysiological changes in cardiovascular system with advancing age, and what are the common cardiac conditions seen in old age and management of these common cardiac problems, and what are the non-pharmacological measures uh, to increase quality of life of uh, life in the elderly people. So I went through many articles to find out what is the definition of elderly, uh, and one of the article in the geriatric journal gave the some you know promising answer actually so there were many definitions uh, what they say is uh, we have to consider a lot of things when we define uh, elderly because you know depending on the the part of the world because then the development of the country and people you know uh, the elderly people if you take japan like developed countries they they live longer and their quality of life is very high and they do a lot of things even in elderly uh, elderly age. So uh, it defines uh, elderly as over 75 years. That is the usual consideration. And um, uh, in that uh, they have divided again into two groups, uh, 65 to 74 years as early elderly and over 75 years as late elderly. Can you hear me? Asita, can you hear me? Yes, yes. So uh, when we talk about cardiac disease, it is a non-communicable disease uh, due, uh, with the improvement in healthcare and sanitation and development of the world. And we do see people live longer and therefore the problems with cardiac care, even any uh, non-communicable disease goes up with, the, with this age group. So if you look at this, uh, this diagram, you can see the the number one cause of death is ischemic heart disease, even worldwide. This was published by uh, WHO in 2016. So therefore ischemic heart disease management is very important, even at uh, general practitioner's perspective. So uh, next, uh, just we look at what are the pathophysiological changes take place in, uh, take place with advancing age. 
you know, we have to discuss about, we, know, we should know about the pathophysiological changes in the heart as well as in blood vessel. I'm not going in detail because it's going to be a theoretical talk, but just to know about what is happening inside the vessels. So vessels in the younger age are more, you know, uh, stretchable and it can accommodate volume without increasing the blood pressure. However, when you become older, your elasticity of blood vessel is reduced and they become more stiffer. Therefore, accommodating volume is reduced and the, this is why the patient this is why the patient develop isolated systolic hypertension their blood their blood pressure you know diastolic blood pressure actually reduced and the, you get widened pulse pressure because of hypertension uh, uh, patient develop uh, left ventricular hypertrophy in the heart there will be myocyte death and hypertrophy of the myocyte and again the left ventricle becomes stiffer and lead into poor relaxation. So that leads to diastolic dysfunction. So we can, and, and also the pressure and these changes, the loss of myocyte lead to uh, heart failure. So heart failure could be diastolic or systolic. Uh, diastolic dysfunction, which common in elderly patients, you do come across a patient with heart failure symptoms, but when you do echocardiography, they are, uh, ejection fraction is normal, but you can't find a cause why these patients are so dysnic and it's very difficult to treat as well. Apart from that, there are other structures like valves and you know, uh, with the advancing age, the valve becomes degenerative and they, they, they become stenose, or especially in my aortic valve, this very common in elderly group, uh, their aortic valve stenosis uh, leads to severe mobility. In, in mitral valve, mitral degenerate to mitral valve causes caudal rupture and mitral regurgitation, and then uh, they they'll end up in heart failure and pulmonary edema. So, uh, the, uh, there are changes take place in uh, receptor levels, and uh, uh, therefore the reduction in number of receptors causes increase in catecholamines levels, and also number of uh, pacemaker cells reduce during during the age, which causes uh, uh, which causes uh, heart block, various types of heart blocks, and I will discuss later, and uh, <clears throat> uh, and sick sinus syndrome due to AVO uh, sinus node dysfunction, especially because of fibrosis taking place inside uh, inside the heart. So there will be common condition that I would like to discuss during this talk. Uh, ischemic heart disease, hypertension, dyslipidemia, atrial fibrillation, common bradyarrhythmia, heart failure, valvular heart disease, especially relating to the elderly people. So when we talk about ischemic heart disease, ischemic heart disease is due to coronary artery disease. You know that the coronary artery disease starts even younger age, maybe fetal life like fatty streaks, even living in the intima. So intimal damage uh, and <coughs> deposition of fat inside the vessels gradually increases and they, they developed into significant pathoroma and present with various syndromes. So now uh, we can divide atherosclerotic heart disease into two common categories. One is chronic coronary syndrome and the one is acute coronary syndrome. The chronic coronary syndrome, of course, a new term, which is by the ESC guidelines and they have removed the term stable angina. So if that's, the term stable angina is not being used anymore, instead uh, chronic coronary syndrome. So I will tell why it is uh, in a while. So when you take uh, chronic coronary syndrome, it's previously called stable patients. That is because this, this is, you know, coronary artery disease has spectrum of presentation and every now and then our vasculature changes. So changes are, take place every now and then. Therefore, the patient can develop, uh, go into acute coronary syndrome at any given time. So this is called dynamic process. Therefore, it is not stable as such, but it relatively may be stable for a while. But patient who, <coughs> who, who, who comply with the treatment and uh, who is, uh, uh, who is uh, very conversant with the, uh, their lifestyle modification or get the adequate revascularization when needed, uh, they have better prognosis. However, patients who do not get you know, uh, proper treatment or do not do 
their lifestyle modification and no revascularization, their uh, risk of death is increased, which is shown in the upper line or in red. So chronic coronary syndrome patient can have different presentation, actually in six groups, but I'm not going to discuss each and every one. But this is common in elderly because you know the amount of atherosclerosis burden increases with elderly patients. They do present if with severe left ventricular dysfunction, even without having a history of any chest pain previously. Therefore, your history taking is quite important. Sometimes if you dig into very detailed history, only they will tell that I had gastritis, but which is which may be not actually gastritis. This is the term nowadays people use a lot and we are also misled with that term. So you must ask the patient about what do you mean by it? What, you, when do you, what, what sort of a pain that you get? And so then otherwise you will also miss this important patient, which we can do something if you identify uh, early in the early before letting you know their ejection fraction lower into severe LV dysfunction. And it will also be costly because these drugs are very costly uh, when we treat uh, heart failure. So a little bit about uh, acute coronary syndrome. So this is the other spectrum of disease because this, you know, this um, acute coronary, chronic coronary syndrome, the patient can go into uh, acute coronary syndrome at any given time from chronic coronary and when the patient becomes stable after some time, who treat, uh, who get the treatment uh, for acute coronary syndrome, become relatively stable, and then we call it chronic coronary syndrome. Acute coronary syndrome, the patient present with chest pain, especially in elderly patients, you have to remember their pain may not be very obvious. So proper history taking and with adequate time should not be implemented. Otherwise, you can miss these patients. So. And also these patients, you know, elderly patients are quite immobile and they have other problems like osteoarthritis, especially knee joint, their mobility is highly restricted. Therefore, angina is, may not be the presentation. They may have other symptoms, which I will show you in the next slide. So it's the elevation, MI is the extreme ex spectrum of disease, or sometimes patients can even die with a very massive MI. So non ST elevation MI, uh, is uh, diagnosed when there are no ST elevation, but troponin, when the troponin is positive. Unstable angina, we call it where there is a plant which is unstable, but it has not ruptured that much, causing that much of myocyte damage to cause troponin to come out. As you know, troponin test has, you know, few generation troponin, third generation or highly sensitive troponin is the best one that you could do and which can detect troponin even in normal persons. So uh, troponin rise more than 99th centile, 95th centile would be a very, very, very good marker of uh, diagnosing acute coronary syndrome with a given history. But you have to remember there are many causes that can have uh, false troponin positive, like in renal disease without MI, <clears throat> without plaque rupture, actually. So, Troponin test, if you do highly sensitive troponin, you don't have to wait till four hours. You can do it then and there, and you can repeat it one hour or two hours after, after the initial one, then you can see the delta rise of troponin. There are protocols uh, by ESC, uh, then you can use one of these uh, algorithms to diagnose acute coronary syndrome. So just, uh, I would like to discuss in one case scenario, uh, about acute coronary syndrome. So this is an 82 year old man, uh, who old man with a history of type two diabetes and hypertension presented to the ED emergency department with the episode of transient loss of consciousness. This is the ECG. What is the diagnosis in this patient? So when you look at the ECG, this patient has come with actually the history of loss of consciousness. Patient may not tell you about chest pain. So these patients might end up in orthopedic board with a fracture or some surgical board. But if you don't, you know, if the emergency department doctor do not take ECG or take proper history, you will miss the important diagnosis. This is the cause for the fall in these elderly patients because their symptoms are very vague. 
So if you look at the CCG, you can see the QRS complexes are occurring in very long distance, uh, more than 10 large squares. So the heart rate is less than obviously 30, that is the ventricular rate. So obviously 30, but they, they, they are regular. Uh, when you see the P wave, that's what you have when you interpret this, you have to see the P waves. The P waves, uh, they are in regular intervals. It's about 90 to 100 rates. So the P waves rate, that is atrial rate, is uh, higher than the ventricular rate, and there is no correlation between P waves and QRS complexes. So this is the complete heart block. If you look carefully, just complete diagnosing, complete heart block is not adequate in this patient. So you have to diagnose, try to diagnose why complete. When always, you know, you come across a complete heart block, this, these are very common percent. I have seen enough patients coming like this, but you know, the, uh, uh, the important diagnosis could be missed. So when you carefully look at, you know, the inferior leads, you could see there is a subtle ST elevation. So this is this inferior ST elevation. Uh, which is probably a right coronary artery occlusion uh, leading to a complete heart block and, uh, and inferior myocardial, acute inferior myocardial infarction. So these things should not be missed because if you should manage immediately because time is muscle when, you, when it comes to uh, ST elevation MI. So you can't delay because when you want to, if you have to thrombolize, you have to do it within 12 hours. If you had to do PCR, you had to do it less than 48 hours. So how do you manage this page? The diagnosis is inferior. It might be complete heart block, depending on the time or the onset of pain. But at GP, general practitioner level, if the patient comes to you, you could palpate the pulse, you see the pulse rate is quite low. And if you have facilities, you can do the ECG and uh, and uh, see and see these changes. So then you can immediately give the important medication because aspirin alone, if you given if you give it crushed and to swallow, I mean with water, <coughs> dissolved aspirin, it uh, absorbs very quickly and can sometimes dissolve the clot. If it is early clot, it is rich in uh, rich in uh, uh, platelet, they dissolve with antiplatelet alone. So. The, the antiplatelet dose is 300, aspirin 300. How much clopidogrel will you give this patient? What are the things that uh, when you give the second antiplatelet? Second antiplatelet, there are a few options. The clopidogrel is the commonest av available drug. That's a good drug to give. But remember, clopidogrel stat dose is not 300 milligrams in elderly patients above 75 years of age. It is only 75 milligrams. So don't give... Uh, don't give uh, 300 milligram of propidogel because the risk of bleeding when you thrombolyze, because this patient may need thrombolysis when this patient is sent to a place where thrombolysis is possible. So just give 75 and document all the drugs given and make sure that drugs are not vomited out, right? So if patient has vomited the drug, then we have to uh, be careful and reintroduce the drug, especially when these patients are going into primary PCR. So the options of management, uh, there are two options. This patient either need TNK, TNK is uh, tenity place, which is a newer thrombolytic drug, uh, which we use now, um, or streptokinase, <coughs> which is a cheaper drug and less a specific drug. Uh, or primary PCI when they are, when the facilities are available. If the primary PCI we are there, we don't give thrombolytic. Therefore, we can give topical six hundred to this patient that we can give in the cath lab. So. So the clopidogrel, the two other antiplatelet uh, drugs, which are called P2Y12 inhibitor, like clopidogrel, is either prisugrel and tricuglo, which is not available at your DP practice level, but it do available in our country now. So prisugrel stat dose is 10 milligrams, but we do, do don't give this stat doses uh, when the when the patient is planned for thrombolysis. Thrombolysis only you can do aspirin and clopidogrel, but when the when we do PCI. Only these drugs, Presugil and Tetraquilo, are important. And these drugs, uh, Tetraquilo is a bit expensive, and but their action is more potent. And uh, the uh, in acute coronary syndrome, there is obvious benefit of giving these drugs. So, uh, as I told you, when it comes to elderly patients, their presentation of acute coronary syndrome could be big. So, generalized weakness, excessive fatigue syncope, altered mental state, abdominal pain, 
feeling of uh, fullness, uh, pal palpitation, back pain, and uh, loss of appetite in digestion in contrast to typical presentation of chest pain like chest discomfort, pressure, tightness, squeezing, crushing pain with autonomic symptoms like sweating, nausea, uh, you know, are the main symptoms of acute coronary syndrome. Therefore, uh, thorough history, proper evaluation, and doing uh, adequate investigations and reviewing the patient is quite important not to miss important diagnosis of acute coronary syndrome at your level. So next I would like to talk about hypertension because this is one of the common, uh, commonest I would say, and again, a misdiagnosed condition. I mean, not misdiagnosed, not properly diagnosed. And, uh, and also uh, uh, sometimes it's overdiagnosed and also not properly managed. Even the diagnosis is made, patient <clears throat> is not aware of symptoms. So symptoms appear uh, very late in hypertension. This is why it is called a silent killer. This is why it is important. This leads to uh, uh, un uncontrolled hypertension leads to uh, other, uh, other comorbidities like ischemic heart disease, as well as atrial fibrillation are some examples of uh, cardiovascular, you know, causes, they end up in organ damage as well. Uh, I will talk in a, in a minute. So uh, how to diagnose hypertension? Proper blood pressure monitor, uh, measurement is very, very important, which we never do in our settings. So quiet room, comfortable temperature, which we never have most of the places, but in TP practice, probably you have very nice rooms uh, with probably with air conditioning. Patients should not be smoking, uh, not, not, should not take coffee or exercise for last 30 minutes and bladder should be empty uh, and relax for at least about three to four minutes. If, ideally, we have to take, you have to take about three to four measurements and uh, better to average the last two measurements uh, as the uh, measured BP. And patient not, should not be talking uh, during the blood pressure measurement and should not use the cuff over the clothes. So you should have a bare arm and also cuff size is also important. About 70% of upper arms should be covered with the cuff. Uh, and validated electronic devices can also be used. And the seating position is also important. You can see the, 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 the shape of the chair and the, the straight back support is also important to relax the muscle and to get the proper blood pressure. And also, I also advise when you check the blood pressure, please remember to palpate the cranial pulse or at least brachial pulse to get the idea about the blood pressure, systolic blood pressure. Otherwise, you might miss very high blood pressures um, uh, when you just you know don't inflate adequately uh, to that high to get the blood pressure with the stethoscope. So the, when, when we measure blood pressure, it is, uh, we have a few options, like you know, we use uh, manual blood pressure measurement, that's called office blood pressure. Uh, and we can ask the patient to do home blood pressure monitoring. And the most sophisticated one is the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. Uh, reason, I mean, ESC guidelines and all the other guidelines also emphasize the importance of uh, home blood pressure monitoring and ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. I feel like, you know, elderly patients is quite important because they cannot come to your practice each and every day and they can have a record of blood pressure. Otherwise, they will have significant side effects of your treatment and then they will discontinue. They will not come back to you for the treatment because this doctor is giving treatment. I get dizzy after treatment. Why should I go back to this? And I should not take this treatment. So. This, is, this can be prevented by uh, these simple measures, but ambulatory blood pressure is not very simple, but home blood pressure monitoring is what I do in my practice, ask the patient to have a record, and they have something to do at home also, and they also engage in their management. So when we talk about management of hypertension, there are several guidelines, uh, and there are some studies I'll show you later, which are done on elderly people, there are these guidelines for each, I mean, any, any age. Uh, so this is ESC, what we commonly use. We also use AHA and IA, International Society of Hypertension for Global Hypertension Practice Guidelines, Japanese and many from all over the world, the guidelines are coming that 
one, anyone. There may be some differences each and every one, but you can use whatever you like. So this is the classification according to the EAC guideline, optimal blood pressure. You can see less than 120 and 80 for any age. And normal blood pressure uh, is 120, 129. Likewise, uh, grade one hypertension is systolic 140, 159 in between, and the 90 to 99 of diastolic blood pressure. Uh, grade two hypertension, grade three is the very high blood pressure is one over 180, and the diastolic blood pressure is one. 110 isolated systolic hypertension, which is the one we commonly see in elderly in ESC guideline, define it as 140 over 145, uh, and the diastolic pressure has to be less than 90. Even actually, their blood pressure is quite low. Diastolic blood pressure is in fact is low. Um, so some other guideline define it as 160. I will discuss later. So when we use uh, uh, other blood pressure measurements like uh, ambulatory blood pressure, you can get uh, more details. You can get data in mean, nighttime mean, and 24-hour mean. So their cutoff values are slightly different from office blood pressure because um, they, they are done without doctor's interference. So uh, slightly lower cutoff values are taken as the normal values. Home blood pressure is about, what, 35? Uh, systole at less than 85. So you can uh, you can read this on the guideline, which is available free of charge. So what are the advantages of uh, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring? So which can eliminate the white coat hypertension. It has a stronger prognostic evidence. You can do the nighttime reading measure in real life. Uh, you can get abandoned information. The disadvantages are uh, which is expensive, can be sometimes uncomfortable for the patient. Uh, advantages of home blood pressure monitoring uh, can identify white coat hypertension and mask hypertension again, uh, which are common in, I mean, mask, white coat hypertension is common in elderly, which is a cheaper method and widely available now, a measurement in a home setting, which may be more relaxed than in the doctor's office. Uh, patient also again engage in their blood pressure monitoring process mm, easily can be repeated. Sometimes disadvantages are uh, only static BP, nocturnal pressures are not, cannot be taken in the night, I mean, while sleeping, uh, potential for measurement errors are also there. So you have to carefully interpret these blood pressures, not always, you know, just go by that, but you know, it could be supplementary for your blood pressure measurements always. So these are the indications for home blood pressure and ambulatory blood pressure. Uh, if it is grade one hypertension on office blood pressure, I would rather do ambulatory blood pressure on those patients. Market of BP elevation, we, we see about very high blood pressure, especially in elderly patients, but without any organ damage. So when you do the co echo is normal, but blood pressure is very high, but there are no evidence, then therefore, do a BPM and see whether this is anxiety causing hypertension. But if you start sometime, I get patients actually, uh, when the blood pressure is even slightly elevated, uh, the patient has been started on treatment, which may not be appropriate sometime. You know, if you start treatment, patient has to be on treatment for lifelong, like, you know, unless patient do lifestyle modification, get the, you know, it's very difficult to, you know, stop medication when the patient started some medication. Unless patient, you know, unless you have, uh, you know, you are convinced about hypertension, exactly you just don't start medication without uh, convincing evidence. <clears throat> when, when mask hypertension is more common, <clears throat> I normal obese blood pressure, but <clears throat> uh, you can use it. I will tell you what is mask hy hypertension. Uh, and normal obese uh, BP, in individuals with hypertensive mediated organ damage or high total cardiovascular risk, again, we can use ability <coughs> blood pressure. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, postural or postprandial hypotension in untreated and treated patients can be very well assessed with <coughs> ambulatory or home blood pressure measurement, uh, especially in this common in elderly patients. So we can evaluate the resistant hypertension, evaluation of BP control, especially treated higher risk patients, uh, exaggerated BP response to exercise, 
when there is considerable variability in office BP, evaluating symptoms consistent with hypotension during treatment. Specific, uh, there are specific indications for ABPM rather than warm blood pressure monitoring to assess of nocturnal values and dipping status. So usually your blood pressure dips in the night. So if you have dipping, so that indicates your blood pressure control is good. But uh, in certain conditions like sleep apnea, CKD, endocrine hypertension, your dip dipping is blunted and that carries higher, well, that carries worse prognosis. So you can assess it by doing a ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. That is why I think ambulatory blood pressure is more recommended in NEMA guidelines. So what is white coat hypertension? White coat hypertension is elevated blood pressure that is seen in, uh, that is seen at your office, uh, but actually their blood pressure is not really elevated. So this is more common, 50% of uh, <coughs> in very old patients uh, with elevated uh, BP. So, uh, so that, is, that is why again, ambulatory or home blood pressure is uh, useful. So what is mask hypertension? Mask hypertension is uh, use your normal blood pressure when you, when you check your blood pressure at your office, but these patients have actually elevated blood pressure. Uh, I don't want to discuss, this is not very common in elderly group, but just for the information sake, I just put it because uh, when you see, uh, uh, when I do echo, sometimes I find it in the but their blood, office blood pressure is normal. Then I tend to do a BPM or home blood pressure monitoring actually so to see whether they have hypertension, which is not, uh, which is, uh, which cannot be diagnosed at, at the office. So that is again uh, one of the spectrum of hypertension. So I don't want to discuss about this. So then uh, you have to evaluate uh, <coughs> hypertension mediated organ damage. You know, when the persistent hypertension, which can damage your, uh, your multiple organs in your body. So you have to screen for these patients uh, for hypertension, secondary hypertension as well. So take a proper history of this patient, whether the patient has uh, uh, drugs causing hypertension, family history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, uh, other recreational drug use, diet, alcohol, smoking, uh, change in their body weight recently. So concomitant cardiovascular risk factors and sleep apnea. So detailed history is important uh, in patient with uncontrolled hypertension. So, uh, this is the, one of the organs that commonly get affected is the heart, you know, uh, when the blood pressure is persistent high, we see most of the elderly patients because they had long standing hypertension coming with the severe left ventricular hypertrophy. I do see this is based, these patients after actually they mostly they come uh, after a stroke or, <coughs> or bleeding into intracranial, uh, that's called intracranial hemorrhage. So you can see the left ventricular hypertrophy, which is uh, very marked and left ventricular cavity is reduced. And so if you leave the blood pressure to be uh, this long, so it's very difficult to, uh, you know, reverse the left, this degree of left ventricular hypertrophy, but early hypertrophy can be reversed by proper uh, uh, drug treatment and lifestyle modification. So uh, to identify this, you can just ask the history patient might have chest pain, SOB, palpitation, and patient have features of heart failure, diastolic heart failure, uh, and also do basic investigation at your level, uh, like EC. Oh, you better examine the patient. You can see left ventricular hypertrophy, the heaving apex, and uh, might hear the third heart sounds. And also if you do ECT, you can see uh, you could see a uh, left ventricular hypertrophy pattern where S1 in uh, S wave in V1 and R wave in V5. If you if you if you know add those two, it, if it is more than 35, uh, fulfills the criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy. Um, so uh, this patient need uh, further evaluation. In fact, so examination of retina is again important, probably possible at GP level. Uh, we, we commonly don't do it actually. So if you find these changes of retinopathy of hypertension is indicative of uh, very long standing hypertension. This is the commonly elderly patient present 
to us. I mean, they send us for evaluation of cardiac status, but this is the common presentation, especially in our setting, especially in rural setting patients, do not adhere to the treatment. They end up in disastrous complication with, uh, with paralysis, especially hemorrhage or ischemic stroke with uh, ultimately ending up with debilitated condition depending on family. So uh, renal damage, again, you can ask whether the patient has developed, patient ha whether the patient has uh, proteinuria or edema uh, uh, or itching, they can have renal dysfunction also, uh, where you can do basic tests like serum creatinine or lipstick or urine just to see whether the patient getting a uh, proteinuria <coughs> to assess the uh, renal damage. So some, uh, some patients with hypertension should be or referred for further evaluation. Actually, when you see secondary hypertension, especially in elderly population, uh, when the patient cannot be treated with basic drugs and it's called resistant hypertension, active resistant hypertension is defined as three or more drugs, including uh, the, including a, a diuretic. But if you treat with all that, if the pressure, patient pressure is not well controlled, so you have to refer this patient for further assessment. Patient in whom more detailed assessment uh, of hypertension mediated organ damage is needed, uh, or sudden onset hypertension. If the general, I mean, the, the referring doctor feels that this patient need uh, the evaluation, should not hesitate to refer the patient because it will be very useful for the patient with basic investigation, uh, which is not that very costly. And but the, ultimately, what they get is very important rather than they end up in massive stroke with impairing their whole life. So how to treat hypertension, lifestyle modification, diet and medication are the three uh, aspects of treating hypertension. So before that, I just uh, I will come into that again. Uh, I just want to emphasize on, especially about the management of hypertension elderly patients. So uh, the systolic uh, blood pressure appear to be the major predictor of coronary artery disease in older patients. Uh, in contrast, that diastolic pressure is the major predictor under age 50 years. And all three indices, systolic blood pressure and pulse pressure, I forgot that the systolic blood pressure and the pulse pressure, both are predictors in adult patient, not the diastolic blood pressure. But uh, in, <coughs> in uh, younger patient, it's the diastolic blood pressure, it's the major predictor of CV event. But when it comes to middle age, like 50 to 59, both are equal predictors of uh, cardiovascular event. So that need to be kept in mind uh, because we have to treat systolic hypertension in elderly. I will come to that with evidence later. So these are the actually treatment trials. These are randomized treatment trials done in elderly patients about the treatment of hypertension, especially the systolic hypertension. SHED trial, IVA trial, STOP trial, all that done in and all that have shown the benefit of treating hypertension uh, of elderly patients. So how do we treat? What are the principles of treatment? Actually, drug therapy should be started in patients uh, when the lifestyle modification are not sufficient. The general principles are number of, uh, there are a number of issues to be considered. Problem of orthostatic hypertension and the problem of frailty. So, Drug doses should be started, uh, initial dose should be very low and uh, half of the dose of the younger patients. And in older patients, their barrel receptor sensitivity is reduced and neural response, all these are impaired. Cerebral, cerebral autoregulation is impaired. That's in the absence of uh, hypertensive emergency, so urgency, uh, blood pressure should be lowered to goal gradually over a period of two to four months, not very immediate. So you have to, uh, uh, you have to uh, uh, tell the patient actually, so to, uh, to reduce blood, we are going to reduce blood pressure very slowly, not immediately, but patient will not expect that. So problem of orthostatic hypotension. So it's a potentially limiting factor of using antihypertensive Therapy, they, 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 they tend to fall. It's one of the commonest cause for fall. And you have to check the, whether the patient is having uh, postural hypertension by 
uh, checking the systolic blood pressure fall more than 20 or diastolic blood pressure falling more than uh, 10 or patient has uh, features of cerebral hypoperfusion such as dizziness. So they are, this is how you diagnose postural hypertension. There are things that uh, you can do to uh, avoid the uh, risk of uh, avoidance of exacerbating factors of postural hypertension. If, you know, getting up quickly will, you know, cause fall because you now it takes time to uh, redistribute uh, blood, uh, blood volume, prolong standing, uh, prolong bed rest, hot showers, low salt intake and heavy, heavy meals and uh, alcohol, many drugs, including diuretic, alpha-propers, tricyclic antidepressants and antipsychotic nitrates, even dopa can cause uh, postural hypertension. There are non-drug therapy uh, to uh, improve postural symptoms, sleeping with health tilt up in the bed, increased fluid intake, salt supplement, causing one leg in front of the other and standing or contracting calf muscles, use of an abdominal binder, compression, stocking, exercise program, and there are drugs like glucocorticoid. I'm not going to into detail. So drug therapy in hypertension, physical activity. Apart from that, I mean, before drug therapy, you have to uh, emphasize on physical activity. Weight reduction uh, is also effective in elderly. Pharmacological treatment, beta blockers. Do not give beta blockers. It's out after British MRC trial. Alpha blockers again now uh, all had trials uh, and diuretics. AC inhibitors and calcium channel blockers are the mainstay of treatment in hypertension. So calcium channel blockers, excellent control of hypertension, uh, control of blood pressure, uh, but there are a spectrum of side effects. You know that constipation, heartburn, ankle edema <coughs> uh, uh, are troublesome side effects. Amlodipine is the drug of choice, uh, reserve diltisem for weight control. Nipidipine, don't give nipidipine in the patient, which has more side effects and should not it should not be used. So diuretic is the standard first choice, you like thiazide diuretic, but start with very small dose, six to five per day, and usual dose is 12.5 per day, and you can increase to 25 uh, per day, but adding another drug might, you have to decrease back to 12.5. Uh, AC inhibitor, first choice, if the evidence of left ventricular dysfunction, diabetes, excellent combination with diuretics. It, it can cause troublesome cough. In that case, we have to, to switch to ARB. So, SHEP trial showed target blood pressure in elderly is 160 or to reduce by uh, initial blood pressure by 10 millimeter Hg. So, uh, dizziness and falls are the worst than hypertension in the elderly. Therefore, if they develop symptoms, you have to be very careful. So, hyperlipidemia, I'm not going in detail, it has uh, only limited data. Uh, but if the patient has ischemic heart disease, the benefit from lipid lowering is, uh, uh, is evidence-based. But in the primary prevention uh, in patient with very older patient uh, with the lifespan is very low, uh, which is not clear actually. Uh, so when you start uh, uh, statins, you have to be careful about uh, side effects, uh, muscle symptoms. Uh, you have to exclude hypothyroidism because before starting statin because it can uh, cause ma more muscle damage. And liver, liver enzyme also can go up with statin. So a uh, little bit about atrial fibrillation. Again, common in elderly, they can present with stable patients. You can diagnose with irregular, irregular heart rate. And there may be various presentations, actually. Sometimes can present with hemodynamically unstable state. So if evaluation is important to is, uh, reduce the risk of thromboembolism, uh, risk of cardiomyopathy and control symptoms. So this is one case I am not going in detail. You can see because of the time factor, I just want to go uh, a bit faster. Um, so you can see the ECG showing uh, where irregular, irregular heart without PV, which is diagnosis of AF. So not very difficult diagnosis actually. So in the management of AF to decide whether patient need dentic regulation, you can use that BASCO which has eight parameters. You, you can see in this patient that the VAT score is uh, four. If zero, do not give any, uh, uh, you don't have to offer anti thrombotic therapy. One to two, you have to consider. But if the one in men and two in women, 
uh, in Chatras uh, two in two or more in men and three or more in uh, women, oral anticoagulation is recommended. So assess the bleeding as well. So what are the oral anticoagulants? So warfarin was the usual drug that we gave, but newer anti oral no, <coughs> newer anti newer oral anticoagulants are available. That's called Novax or Novax directly acting oral anticoagulant, rivaroxabam, epizabam are the, some examples which are available in Sri Lanka now. So which has uh, less uh, drug interactions, uh, lower incidence of intracranial bleeding, and uh, very easy to use. You don't have to monitor. So remember, aspirin is not effective preventing stroke in patient with atrial preparation. So next, the complete heart block and six sinus syndrome, again, common in elderly patients. They present with syncope, presyncope or falls, could be precipitated by rate limiting drugs such as beta blockers and CCP. So if patient has complete heart block and hypertension, don't drink and hypertension, the hypertension is compensatory. So uh, if you treat complete heart block with hypertension, it resolves itself. So six sinus syndrome may need, may not need pacing, can sometimes be just leave alone or manage medically, but complete heart block might need pacing if the patient is symptomatic. So valvular heart disease again, as I told you, common in uh, common in patient with uh, elderly patients because of degenerative changes. You can see aortic stenosis under the commonest cause and uh, mitral regurgitation. Uh, so which uh, the decision making for uh, for the further management is should be done with a heart team approach involving many uh, many people and the patients family as well and we have to assess the uh, assess the suitability for surgery uh, with uh, with certain scores like STS scores where the patient actually is suitable for surgery so these patients should be referred to for further assessment by you guys uh, to a tertiary care center. So heart failure, I'm not going in detail. So we can basically divide into systolic heart failure or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or diastolic heart failure, both present with features of heart failure dyspnea. And uh, there may be, uh, there are a lot of treatment options for heart failure with redu reduced ejection fraction, but limited treatment option with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So these are the drugs we'd be using heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, MRA, ARNI, SDLT2 inhibitors, beta blockers, MRA is spinolactone, ST2 inhibitor is uh, enfaglucosine and dipaglucosine. ARNI is uh, sacrificed to valsartan. These are the labels we use. So then non-pharmacological management of, uh, 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 non I mean, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, ischemic heart disease. These are actually for hypertension, but basically all, uh, all condition, uh, it, it can be applied for or all the uh, <coughs> can, all the cardiac conditions. So lifestyle modification recommends for all patients. Healthy lifestyle choices can prevent or delay onset of high BP and can reduce CV risk. Modification of lifestyle can also enhance the effect of antihypertensive treatment. So diet, reducing salt and uh, prepared food, avoid uh, uh, high uh, food in high salt content. Eating diet rich in whole grain, fruits, vegetables, polyunsaturated fatty, fatty acid, uh, and that dietary products such as di DASH diet, uh, reducing food in sugar, saturated fat, and trans fat. After this, we can read up. Uh, and diet containing nitrates, I want to highlight like diet containing magnesium, calcium, and potassium, like avocado, nuts, seeds, and legumes are useful. Uh, moderate consumption of healthy drinks, uh, alcohol in moderation, if necessary only, uh, and reduce binge drinking, reduce weight and avoid obesity. Be careful with complementary and alternative traditional medicine uh, because there is no evidence. So smoking cessation, regular exercise, reduce stress, and in, uh, introduce mindfulness. Also important, reduce exposure to air pollution and cold temperature. So take home message, uh, again the same, CV prevalence is higher in elderly group. Uh, number of elderly population is increasing, ever increasing. Elderly care obviously is a separate specialty and primary care doctors, GPs have a huge role in the management of elderly patients. Need frequent assessment to enhance their compliance, monitor response, 
and side effects, small starting doses of drugs, uh, and gradual titration to achieve targets. Cardiovascular disease management should be decided on overall outcome of the elderly patients. So these are the take home method. I'm extremely sorry for <laughs> being passed. So this is one of the links that you could use uh, the Australian and New Zealand society guidelines. And there are uh, very nice videos that, uh, that you, can, uh, uh, you can watch, which is free of charge. Uh, thank you so much. If you have any queries or questions, I would like to answer uh, with remaining few minutes. Yes, uh, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ajit. Uh, the forum is uh, for all the members to ask questions and get the answers from our consultant. Yeah, I would like to ask a question from Mr. Now, uh, when it comes to A, the patient comes with A, uh, so how to decide whether this patient is rate control or rhythm control? What are the factors? Are there any factors or how to decide? Yeah, uh, the thing is, uh, Mostly, what you have to do is uh, 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 rate control. If it is due to structural heart disease, rhythm control is most, I mean, different, difficult because uh, it comes due to, you know, like valvular heart disease, yeah, there's a stretching of atria, you know, uh, uh, the mitral stenosis, condition like mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation. They are rate control. I mean, the, to get into sinus rhythm is really difficult. So in these patients, actually, we have to do a rate control, and the most of the time, other you know, the, without any cause. I mean, uh, when you <coughs> uh, when you have AF, especially in elderly, if rhythm control fails, I mean, it's very symptomatic. Then you can consider, uh, I mean, rate control fails. You can consider rhythm control, and patients who are you know like who are not able to take anticoagulation therapy, like you know, bleeding. Uh, stroke and all, we can consider uh, rhythm control where they are, where you don't have to give uh, you don't have to give uh, anticoagulation in these patients. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Actually, it's a very good question. So. Do you have any questions? Um, so I want to ask uh, Dr. Ajit, uh, uh, is the uh, College of Cardiologists in the process of uh, laying down uh, guidelines for general practitioners or the entire doctor population to uh, give proper care for senior citizens? Uh, well, like uh, the guidelines from uh, the College of Cardiology itself is not, I'm not sure because I'm in, I'm in the committee also, but you know, uh, council, but we are not, uh, we have any guidelines at the moment as far as I'm aware for the elderly population alone, but there are some guidelines, you know, which we, we, we not only from the College of Cardiology, but College of Physicians, we also, you know, part of that actually. So we, we also get together with them and then uh, publish certain guidelines. So uh, there are some guidelines coming up like driving uh, in heart disease, but not at the moment with, for the elderly care. And we can, you know, I can, I can uh, ask, you know, the president, uh, we can think of it and just see what we can do actually. Yeah, that's a good suggestion, Asita, yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, the time is yours. Uh, Dr. Ajit is uh, a really busy person, but uh, he has done tremendous work to Anuradhapura uh, and he's uh, handling a very busy cat lab. So, we are really thankful, uh, Dr. Ajit, for your time and uh, having one hour's lecture with us, and uh, we learned a lot.
So please ask any question if you have. We had more than 50 uh, in the audience. Uh, it was 57 at one moment. I'm really happy as the chairperson of the subcommittee. Uh, so it's time to give Dr. Ajit uh, appreciation. Uh, so I'll hand over this e-certificate, uh, Dr. Ajit, for your valuable participation and as a resource person. Um, well, thank you, Ajit, for inviting me also. I think uh, it is... Uh, uh, thank you so much. I can see it. Thank, uh, thank you. Um, uh, thank you for the inviting and uh, just, you know, uh, discussing about very uh, important topics. Uh, I would uh, be happy to contribute even in the future also. If they have any queries, you can, they can text me or WhatsApp any. Uh, is, is, or if they want, I can give my number. Yes, please. Uh, if you tell them, they can uh, actually contact you and even message you in WhatsApp and take your valuable opinion as all the general practitioners. And uh, so we'll say good good night and uh, goodbye. But uh, we will be meeting again in August with another lecture about the senior people in Sri Lanka. And uh, the committee is working a lot, and we have a long term plan, Dr. Ajit. Uh, that is because of the population is getting elderly. We are yeah. we are planning to have district wise uh, elderly homes, uh, which is uh, which are funded by the government or any other sort of funding method, and they will be having uh, one washroom and one room facility for one person who can pay. Actually, because the people who can pay are not having much facilities in Sri Lanka because they are thinking in a long-term manner, we will uh, be working on that. Because there is a ministry uh, a unit called elderly, uh, young elderly and uh, disabled unit, which is run by Dr. Uh, one uh, consultant, community physician. Okay. So does, and we are working on that. Yeah, that is a very good thing actually. Yeah. So thank you very much, Dr. So uh, thank you very much all for the participation and uh, being in the audience for a long time. So we'll say good night and goodbye. Take care all of you. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Good night.